The nine lepers that Jesus healed in Luke chapter 17, verse 11 through 9. I appreciate Brother Ricky doing a marvelous job reading that text just a few moments ago. Amen. Luke's gospel is a fascinating gospel to study. His primary theme in the entire gospel account is Jesus, the Son of Man, seeking and saving that which is lost. That's his primary theme for the entire gospel account. And what is it that's lost? Humanity. Humanity is lost. In Luke's gospel, if you really spend time reading through it, you will find that Luke's gospel emphasizes a lot about people, humanity in general. His gospel emphasizes the poor and lowly people. His gospel emphasizes women. You have Mary, Elizabeth, Hannah, uh, Martha, and etc. His gospel emphasizes on the sick and the diseased people. His gospel emphasizes on the outcast people. He emphasizes children. And the vast majority of Luke's parables that he uses all have reference to people. His gospel emphasizes and focuses a lot on people, humanity. Why? Because humanity is lost. And Jesus, the Son of Man, came to seek and save humanity. Because they are lost. And just as, when you think about it, remember that Luke is a doctor, a genuine doctor. And he, as a genuine doctor, con is concerned and cares about people. Genuine doctors are always caring and concerning for people. Thus, in Luke chapter 17, verse 11 through 19, we see the great physician, the great doctor, Jesus, concerned with the diseased and the outcast, and extends his grace, mercy, and healing towards them. In effect, gratitude, praise, and joy is necessary. This lesson is not intended to just educate the mind, but also to stir the heart and to prick the conscience. Ask yourself, as I will ask myself, this question throughout the lesson, how often is my praise and service given to God motivated by a grateful heart? How often is my praise and service given to God motivated by a grateful heart? Gratitude is the soil of praise. I know the main idea of the handouts that I gave, I had it worded completely different, but I changed it almost last minute because mm -hmm. I thought this was a better main idea to understand the context of the passage that we're focusing on this morning. So go ahead and scratch that out and just put gratitude is the soil of praise. And from our text of Luke chapter 17, verse 11 through 19, we're going to go ahead and divide this into really just two major sections. The first section that I want us to focus on in verses 11 through 19 is the attitudes that are displayed. The attitudes that are displayed from this section of Scripture. It begins by saying that on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers. So first we see the attitudes of the ten lepers. What kind of attitudes are they displaying? Well, it begins by explaining that Jesus, as he entered the village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance. Leprosy at the time was a horrendous disease and required separation from people, towns, and cities, and all populated areas. However, according to the old law, Leviticus chapter 13, verse 45 and 46, and Numbers chapter 5, verse 2 through 4, lepers were allowed to at least go to the gates of the villages or cities and beg for alms. They were allowed to do that only at a distance. So most likely, 
They were standing at the gates of the village just as Jesus was making his way to the entrance. The affliction that the Bible calls leprosy was a dreaded disease which was highly contagious. At first, the disease discolored the skin. It starts off as a pink blemish marked all over your body, and then those blemishes begin to fester into a brown color until it was darkened by a black charcoal color. It ulcerated into sores, ravishing and destroying both the skin and the bone. Death was inevitable within two years for those who had leprosy. So, it was a hopeless end. No cure, no vaccine, no ointment, no treatment, nothing. It was a hopeless end. In your mind, I want you to see ten lepers holding up fingerless hands, maybe even handless arms, flailing and trying to cry out the loud voice to get Jesus' attention. Ears, eyes, nose were probably missing. These were dirty, defeated, outcast people without families, without homes, without jobs, without any friends. Really, the only people that they had were those who were afflicted with the same disease. They had to live in caves, away from people. These were defeated men who were looking for some hope. When Jesus made his way, and when these ten lepers saw him, they cried out. They lifted up their voice, the text says in verse 13. They lifted up their voices, verse 13. The nature of the disease also affected the vocal cords. Tuberculosis was often associated with the affliction. So the voice became hoarse and harsh. I'm sure Sister Gwen just recently <laughs> recovered from an illness where she couldn't barely talk. It was hard and difficult, was it not? With a hoarse and a harsh voice, especially when you're trying to talk to someone who has perhaps maybe disabled hearing and they can't hear you quite well, and you're having to raise your voice as loud as you can just so you can be heard. This is what these men were doing. That is exactly what these men were doing just to get Jesus' attention. They could barely talk, and they're yelling as loud as they can just to get Jesus' attention. And what were they crying out? Verse 13. They cried out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. This is very significant. Never was there a powerful statement than the statement made by the ten lepers right here in Luke's Gospel. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. In Luke's Gospel, here's what makes it very interesting. The word Master had only been used by Jesus' own followers. Chapter 5, verse 5. Whereas, throughout his Gospel account, non-followers use the word teacher. And I have the references made up right here. Don't worry if you don't get them all written down. I do plan to, again, get these uh, PowerPoint slides printed out and hand it to you. This right here, in chapter 17, verse 13, we have the first and only recording in the Gospel of Luke where non-followers refer to Jesus as Master. Why is that significant? This is very significant because these ten lepers who were not followers of Jesus have only heard what Jesus was doing. 
What made this significant is because these 10 lepers, who were non-followers, had done every single thing that they could do in order to get rid of this horrible disease. They probably went to other doctors. They probably went to magicians. They probably even went to sorcerers. They probably even went to or took medication. They probably took uh, herbal uh, medication. They probably took organic, natural remedies, even oil or some kind of ointment they, they would pour all over their body just to stop the sores and to stop the pain from spreading. Nothing. Nothing. This statement is very significant because these 10 lepers who were non-followers saw Jesus as their only hope. They didn't see Jesus as their last hope, no. They saw Jesus as their only hope. They saw Jesus as the one who is able to heal them who is the answer to their prayers that they've been praying for. They knew Jesus, and they knew what he could do. They believed in him. They knew that he was their only hope. And so they called him Master. Yes, you are the Lord. You are the Master. We've come to realize that. There's nothing that we could do. We need you to give us something that we cannot give ourselves. And that's exactly what they're asking for because that's the definition of mercy. For those who have been in our James class on Wednesday night and those who have been uh, attending on Sunday evening through the Sermon on the Mount, we talked a little bit about blessed are the merciful. We talked about extending acts of mercy not too long ago. And that's what the word means, giving something to someone that they cannot give themselves. These men, these ten lepers, could not give themselves healing. They could not give themselves any cure to get rid of this terrible disease that's destroying their, their lives. Jesus, you are the only one who can give us something that we cannot give ourselves. And that's healing. Save us from this horrible, painful disease. Have mercy on us. When Jesus saw them, what did he tell them to do? Verse 14, he says, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Earlier, back in chapter 5, verse 13 and 14, Jesus had cured another leper. But in chapter 5, verse 13 and 14, he touched the leper and said, Be cleansed. And he was healed. On this occasion, however, he tells them to go. They went. And then they were cleansed. Here's also another interesting thing. Is that back in chapter 5, verse 13 and 14... After Jesus healed the leper, he told him to go and show himself to the priest. Here, he tells him to first go and show themselves to the priest, and then they were healed. The reverse is, the order is reversed. One of the jobs of the priests was to serve as the health inspector, Leviticus chapter 14. If the priest concluded that the leper was healed, the man could offer certain sacrifices and then re-enter society. He could return home to his family, go back to work, and go to the temple to worship. So this time, Jesus does not touch them as he did to the first leper back in chapter 5, but he tells them to go show themselves to the priest. They did, and as they went, they were cleansed. Jesus has power over time and space. Jesus did not have to touch them or be physically seen or to be physically present by their side in order to heal them. The question is, did the lepers believe he could do that? By commanding them to go to show themselves to the priest would test the genuineness of their faith. 
Imagine you with this tor her uh, to terrible disease, if I can speak correctly, with this terrible disease, and you're standing before Jesus, and he just tells you, he doesn't touch you and say, be cleansed, he just tells you to go on your merry way. What would you say? Would you go on your merry way, or would you be a little bit confused and say, wait a minute, I mean, are you going to first heal me? I like to be healed and then go on my merry way. So you see, this was a test of the genuineness of their faith. Think of it as we talked about briefly in our class this morning of Naaman. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 10 through 14. Here is a man by the name of Naaman who had leprosy, the same disease. And he wanted to be healed. And so he went to God's prophet at the time, Elisha. And Elisha sent his servant out and said, Tell Naaman this, go dip yourselves into the Jordan seven times. Then you'll be cleansed. Well, what did Naaman have to do? Well, by doing that was a test of the genuineness of his faith. He had to act on it by going down to the Jordan and to dip seven times. Now, first he was upset and angry because the Jordan River was a dirty river at the time. And he's like, I want to go to a clean river. And so Naaman's own servant says, really, in essence, quit being such a big baby, pull up your britches, and just do it. How hard is it? How hard, how difficult is it for you just to go into the river and dip yourself seven times? Just do it and quit complaining. And so, he did it. He did it seven times. And it wasn't until that seventh time he was cleansed. Faith in the Bible is always accompanied by action and obedience. Imagine what it would have been like as soundness returned to their body. As their eyes ears and throats were healed as old sores dropped off and the skin became healthy as new bones formed as the arteries and the nerves and the veins began to form over it and then above that fresh new skin over those missing or once missing limbs but now that are whole again Imagine the excitement that filled their lives. We don't know how long these men had the disease. They could have had it for a long time. I can go back home again. I can go back to work again. I can go back to society again. <coughs> I can go back to the temple and worship my God again. I can go home and hug my children and they can see me in my eyes and I can see them again. I can go home and to touch the warm skin on the face of my wife again. I think of the scene from the movie Judah Ben-Hur has anybody ever seen that movie? <clears throat> Judah Ben Hur? Show of hands. Wonderful movie. And I think of the scene towards the very end where the main character, his whole life, always thought that his mother and his sister either abandoned him or were killed, never knew where they were. Later in the movie, he found out where they were, living in a cave because they had leprosy. At the end of the movie, they were healed of their leprosy after the death of Jesus on the cross. And the scene was just filled with so much joy. The mother and the daughter touching their faces again, touching one another again, praising God, thanking him. And the main character was, be able, was able to reunite with his family again. Beautiful, beautiful scene that we have here of the ten lepers being healed. And I want you to note the similarities between these ten men. All were afflicted with a terrible disease, number one. All determined to do something about it. Number three, all believed that Jesus could help in some way. 
Number four, all obeyed Jesus and started on the way to where the priests were. And number five, all were healed. Five similarities that these ten lepers shared. But there was one major contrast. One, and only one, was grateful. Verse 15 and following. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Verse 15 begins, then one of them. No doubt, people may think, well, wait a minute, why did he turn back? If he was to go and show himself to the priests, but he turned back, did he disobey Jesus? No. No, he didn't disobey Jesus. Without a doubt, the man would have gone and made the trip to go see the priests, to obey Jesus. But first, he just wanted to turn back around and to extend and show his appreciation and gratitude to Jesus. This man, this one man, knew the source of his healing was Jesus. He turned back praising God with a loud voice, not with the hoarse cry of a leper, but with the strong voice of a healed man. He recognized Jesus as deity, as God, and fell at his feet, worshiping him and giving him thanks. Giving him thanks in the Greek text is in the present tense, which means that he kept on thanking him. He kept on thanking Jesus because he's healed of this terrible disease that he had for such a long time. He's thanking him because now he can go back to some form of normalcy of his life. And he couldn't stop thanking Jesus. I know Luke doesn't tell us, but I imagine this man just continually thanking him where Jesus is trying to finally get in a word, but the man keeps interrupting Jesus, saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. But when Jesus finally does get in a word, he asks a question. But before we get to that question, notice that Luke tells us the identity of this man. He was a Samaritan. This healed man was none other than a Samaritan. Samaritans and Jews did not get along with one another. They hated each other. And Jesus being a full, pure Jew, hmm, he probably would have thought that the last person to ever thank him would be a Samaritan. Often we receive appreciation and gratitude from those we least expect to show it with those from whom we expect thanks, often take our efforts for granted, on the other hand. The average reader would expect all ten of them to show gratitude, but we see Jesus asking that very question. Where are the other nine? Were not ten cleansed? Luke does not tell us where they were and what they did. But we can make some logical, relevant suggestions. Perhaps one of the nine didn't think about saying thank you. Perhaps one of the nine thought about it, but didn't think he needed to show gratitude. Perhaps one of the nine just got too busy. Perhaps one of the nine became preoccupied with other things. Perhaps one of the nine never grew up in a home where gratitude was taught. Perhaps one of the nine just thought that, hey, I will see Jesus later on in the day and I can just thank him then. Perhaps one of the nine gave glory to the priests instead. Perhaps one of the nine just got too eager to see his family again that he forgot all about the one who enabled him to see his family again. Perhaps one of the nine went to celebrate his recovery with worldly pleasures. I know many close friends of mine 
You've had terrible diseases, cancer, fought cancer for so many years, overcame cancer, but decide to go out and celebrate it by having a party, getting drunk, living it up with worldly pleasures. Jesus then asked another sad question. Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Now the word translated foreigner was the word found in this inscription at the entrance from the court of the Gentiles to the court of the women. It says this right here, Let no man of another nation enter inside the barrier and the fence around the temple. Whoever is caught will have himself to blame that his death follows. This man could not even go into the court of the Jews to have access where the priests were. Because at the temple in Jerusalem, near Jerusalem, they had four courts. There was the court of the Gentiles. Non-Jews and foreigners can only go in there. Then they had the court of the women, for the Jewish women. Then they had the court of the Jews, the Jewish men. Then they had the court of the priests. The court of the priests is where all the temple worship would take place. In order to see the priests, you had to at least be in the temple of the Jews. So this Samaritan, to begin with, would have had a very hard time trying to get access to try to see the priest. But he knew that he could go to Jesus. He knew that he could come to Jesus. And what did Jesus say? Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. The Greek text literally translates, your faith has saved you. Better translation right there. Your faith has saved you. The nine ungrateful Jews had been made whole physically. But Jesus pronounced a special blessing on the one grateful Samaritan. Jesus was saying that your faith in the expression and giving thanks has made you well both physically and spiritually. In other words, salvation has come to your house. Luke chapter 19 verse 9. That was the major contrast that stood out because this one man was grateful while nine others were nowhere to be found and expressed a huge ungrateful attitude. We stand to one side and we look at the statistics in this account. Only one out of ten came to give Jesus thanks. Only 10%, think of, of that folks, only 10%. And when we look at it from that angle, we may be shocked completely. But then we stop and we think to ourselves, is the percentage any better today? All of us know that ingratitude is terrible. Boy, I was raised in a home of hardcore gratitude. I shared with you before about how my grandfather always said to me that when somebody does something for you that you cannot do for yourself, you better say thank you. And you better show how thankful you are. And I'm very thankful <laughs> that he branded that within my mind. But even though all of us know that ingratitude and an ungrateful attitude is terrible, how much of this knowledge really impacts our life? As we read the account of the one out of ten who returned to thank Jesus, each of us need to ask the question, what is my GQ? What is my gratitude quotient? Well, the Bible puts great stress on being thankful. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, Paul says, Devote yourselves to prayer keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, Paul again says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. We always have something to be thankful for. 
on a Thanksgiving day, a little boy who wore glasses expressed to his family around him saying that I am very thankful for my glasses. And one of the members asked the little boy saying, is it because it helps you to see? The boy answered, no. It's because it keeps the boys from beating me up and the girls from kissing me. <laughs> and that little boy grew up to be Brother Sid Scudder. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, he knows I'm joking with him. In everything, give thanks, folks. We always have something to be thankful for. And so I want us to examine some of the applications that we can discover from this lesson right here of Luke chapter 17, verse 11 through, nine, uh, 11 through 19. As far as it comes to having a grateful attitude and showing our thanks, one application that we can learn is, are we as thankful as we should be in our homes? When Paul wrote of the sad condition of mankind in days ahead, he wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 and following, he says, For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful. Is it only a coincidence that after Paul said disobedient to parents, he put ungrateful? Well, I don't know if that is a coincidence, but I do know that many of us have been ungrateful to our parents at a time. I'm sure many of us in here, as parents and grandparents, have probably experienced your child, daughter, or your grandson or granddaughter at a time being a little bit unthankful to you. In our early years, we all grew up with parents that we depended on really for everything. And too often, the time comes when an aged parent is a nuisance and young people are unwilling to pay or to repay the debt that is owed to them. Have we said thank you to our parents? Have we said thank you to our grandparents? What about our spouse? Have we said thank you to our spouse? I believe we need to. We need to do so before it's too late. There's a certain woman who made a good living with a high paying job, very well educated, and she was very respected among her community. But her husband had only a low grade education. He was a successful farmer but he didn't make as much as she did. Well, he died suddenly and unexpectedly. And throughout her whole years of marriage, she had always kept bashing him, saying hateful things to him because he's not bringing in enough money to put food on the table. Well, he died suddenly and unexpectedly. And for years afterward, this widow experienced mental problems, including depression, so severe that she required shock therapy. What was her problem? Well, she felt guilty. She felt guilty because she looked down on her husband while he lived. She had belittled him and shamed him rather than respecting him and thanking him. After he died, she realized the wrong that she had done, how ungrateful that she was. But it was too late. Have we said thank you to our spouse? I think we need to before it's too late. Have we said thank you to our parents or grandparents? We need to before it's too late. Are we as thankful as we should be to our Fellow man, another application that we can discover from the text. When we think of an ingratitude to our fellow man, many biblical examples come to mind. There's Laban, who did not appreciate the efforts of Jacob, his son-in-law, Genesis 31. 
There's the butler who forgot Joseph in prison, Genesis chapter 40, verse 23. The children of Israel who kept complaining about the food they ate in the wilderness, Numbers chapter 11. Many biblical examples of an ungrateful attitude. Each of us owes a great debt to many people who have impacted our lives tremendously. They may be friends, brothers, and sisters in Christ, or teachers. Some of us may be indebted to doctors, perhaps surgeons who saved our lives. Perhaps some of us have mentors that have guided us and gave us good, biblical, sound, uh, godly uh, wisdom from the scriptures throughout our lives to help us keep us on track. Have we said thank you? Let us do it before it's too late. Lastly, and most importantly, we find this tremendous application from the text. Are we as thankful as we should be to God? Surely the most grievous failing of each of us is a failure to say thank you to God for all of the blessings. The psalmist said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Psalm 103, verse 2. We have sunshine and rain, the sun, moon, and stars, flowers, trees, and birds, apples, eggs, and peanut butter. We even have our daily routines. Have we stopped to just even thank God for that? In addition, what special benefits we have, even as Jesus gave a special blessing to the Samaritan. Have you ever been physically sick and gotten well? Sister Gwen, she'd be the first one to raise her hand up. Have you ever been spiritually sick and have gotten well? Have you ever been spiritually outcasted from sin in your life and have been made whole again and able to enter the body of Jesus Christ, his kingdom? Have you had the opportunity to hear, know, and obey the gospel? Did you ever find a mate who also loves the Lord as much as you do? Has the Lord given you children? Has the Lord given you grandchildren? Has the Lord given you great-grandchildren? Have you had the privilege of knowing some of God's great saints? Someone has said that the hardest arithmetic, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, <laughs> to master is the ability to count our blessings. We have that song, count your many blessings, name them one by one. Most of all, we should be thankful for what Paul called God's indescribable gift, Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. Never in the history of the universe have so many owed so much to just one. How thankful are we for all the Lord has done for us? If we are thankful, how do we express our thankfulness to him? When we meet around the Lord's table, will he be asking, where are the other nine? When the collection plate passes... Will he have to ask, where are the other nine? When we meet to praise the Lord on Sunday night, would he have to ask the question, where are the other nine? When we meet on Wednesday night to learn more of his word, will he have to ask the question, where are the other nine? When it's time for church events, activities, and evangelism so that we can share the blessing of salvation to those that we come into contact with, will he have to ask the question, where are the other nine? Spend a few moments thinking of all God has done for you. Then give him thanks. Don't leave him with a heavy heart asking the question, where are the other nine? Gratitude is the soil of praise. If you really appreciate what the Lord has done for you, you will not wait or hesitate to do what he commands of you to do. Whether it is needing to be saved, having your sins washed away, obeying the gospel, believing that he is the son of the living God, confessing him as Lord, master, and ruler of your life, 
repenting of your sins, turning away, having a change of heart, a change of attitude, and a change of life. And having your sins washed away as you come into contact with his blood and the waters of baptism to be saved, to be forgiven, and to be able to enter into society. Not just any society, but his kingdom, the church. Maybe there's one here this morning who needs to get right with the Lord. Who probably has sin in his or her life. And needs to ask and confess those sins and to ask for forgiveness. Well, the invitation is offered and extended for you as well. Again, confess your sins one to another. And the prayer of a righteous man is very powerful. James 5, 16. That is a command, folks. That is a command. And if you really want to express your gratitude and thanksgiving, you'll do what he commands. If you have any need whatsoever, I encourage you, please come forward together as we stand and as we sing. Almost persuaded now to believe. Almost persuaded. Christ.